You can hear me without the mic. That's a good thing. <laughs> That's a good thing. No, it really is good to be here. We, uh, we were out last Sunday uh, spending a weekend with family that we have not had a chance to do this, uh, this calendar year yet with the whole family together, so that was a blessing. Thank you for, I uh, got some kind notes from you all. Thank you for the prayers and all of that. That was a sweet blessing um, for us. But it is good to be back uh, every time, you know, we, we are just uh, following you and, and praying for you and thinking about you all the time. And I hope that, uh, that you all are, are uh, like that to one another. We, we want to see God move here. Is that right? We're simply asking that God will do a mighty move that we have not experienced in a long time and maybe never. We always look forward to God. And I want to reiterate what I said the last uh, number of Sundays also. We come together to meet with God. We're not coming together to do a certain kind of liturgy and walk through things. Although we enjoy singing his praises, absolutely we should do that. Absolutely we should read his word. Absolutely we should listen to that. Absolutely we should lift our prayers. But we're doing that to meet with the Almighty, yes? And so I want you to feel free to do that. If he speaks to you in the middle of the sermon, if he speaks to you at any time, just come up. You know, kneel here, turn around where you're sitting, kneel there, uh, or, or just uh, spend some time with God. This is what, what this is about. And so I'm going to spend some time now reading a full chapter from Scripture. And I kind of want to highlight to you also, because sometimes we can get the impression that Scripture is, is like a springboard. We'll read some of that and then talk about it, Yes. The reading itself of Scripture is an act of worship. It really is. Just to read God's Word is an act of worship, and we do that gladly and, and, and gratefully this morning. Chapter 18 of the book of Genesis. Here's how nice this is. Just start in the beginning and go to chapter 18. We're not in Habakkuk, right? You don't have to look the whole morning to find it. We are right here, chapter 18 of Genesis. The Lord appeared to Abraham at the oaks of Mamre while he was sitting at the entrance of his tent during the heat of the day. He looked up, and he saw three men standing near him. When he saw them, he ran from the entrance of the tent to meet them, bowed down to the ground, and said, My Lord, if I have found favor uh, with you, please do not go past your servant." Let the little water be brought uh, that you may wash your feet and rest yourself under a tree. I will bring a bit of bread so that you may strengthen yourself. This is why you have passed your servant's way. Later, you can continue on. Yes, they replied, do as you have said. And so Abraham hurried into the tent and said to Sarah, Quick, need some uh, measures of fine flour and make a bread. Abraham ran to the herd and got a tender choice calf. He gave it to a young man who hurried to prepare it. Then Abraham took curds, that's butter, and milk <laughs> as well as the calf and he had prepared, uh, that he had prepared and set them before the men. He served them as they ate under the tree. Where is your wife Sarah, they asked him. They're in the tent, he answered. The Lord said, I will certainly come back to you in about a year's time, and your wife Sarah will have a son. Now Sarah was listening at the entrance of the tent behind him, and Abraham and Sarah were old and getting on in years. That's a better way of saying that, right? Getting on in years. <laughs> and Sarah had passed the age of childbearing. So she laughed to herself, after I'm worn out and my Lord is old, will I have delight? But the Lord asked Abraham, why did Sarah laugh saying, can I really have a baby when I'm old? Is anything impossible for the Lord? At the appointed time, I'll come back to you, and in about a year, she will have a son. Sarah denied it. I did not laugh, she said, because she was afraid. But he replied, 
No, you did laugh. The men got up from there and, and looked over Sodom, and, sa and, and Ab Abraham was walking with them to set them off, or to see them off. Then the Lord said, Should I hide what I'm about to do from Abraham? Abraham is to become a great and powerful nation, and all the nations of the earth will be blessed through him. For I have chosen him so that he will command his children and his house after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just. This is how the Lord will fulfill to Abraham what he had promised him. Then the Lord said, The outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is immense, and their sin is extremely serious. I will go down to see if they have done... Uh, if what they've done justifies the cry that has come up to me. If not, I'll find out. The men turned from there and went towards Sodom while Abraham remained standing before the Lord. And Abraham stepped forward and said, Will you really sweep away the righteous with the wicked? What if there are 50 righteous people in the city? Will you really sweep it away instead of sparing the place for the sake of the 50 righteous people who are in it. You could possibly do such a thing to kill, you could not possibly do such a thing to kill the righteous with the wicked, treating the righteous and the wicked alike. You could not possibly do that. Won't the judge of the whole earth do what is just? The Lord said, if I find 50 righteous people in the city of Sodom, I will spare the whole place for their sake. Then Abraham answered, Since I have ventured to speak to my Lord, even though I am dust and ashes, suppose the 50 righteous lack five. Will you destroy the whole city for the lack of five? He replied, I will not destroy it if I find 45 there. Then he spoke to him again, Suppose there are 40 found there. He answered, I will not do it uh, on account of 40. Then he said, let my Lord not be angry, and I, speak, and I will speak further. Suppose 30 are found there. He answered, I will not do it if I find 30 there. Then he said, since I have ventured to speak to my Lord, suppose 20 are found there. He replied, I will not destroy it on account of 20. Then he said, let my Lord not be angry, and I will speak one more time. Suppose ten are found there. He answered, I will not destroy it on account of ten. When the Lord had finished speaking with Abraham, he repeated, uh, he departed, and Abraham returned to his place. May God add the blessing of the reading of his word. This is a story that so many times have been misunderstood. You know, some people have read that and, and acted as if God was some kind of used car salesman where you can kind of dig around the price a bit, right? Kind of negotiate him down. If you're smooth enough, find the right argument, you get the price down. That's a complete misunderstanding. This is about God. Actually, we preach from God's Word because we, in God's Word, learn who God is that we may be learned to trust Him and trust His promises, right? Some places are happy to talk a lot about who you are and what you should do and all of that. We think that the Bible speaks to who God is, and because we get to know Him, he will let us know his way and his will. And as we look at this text, we'll see that come out somewhat clearly. I'm sure many of us have tried and often felt that our prayers just got to the ceiling. That's it. We uttered it, and it rose to the ceiling, and no further. There seems to be no real kind of consequence from our prayers. Is that you sometimes? I'm the only one. Come on. 
I, I need you to see what's going on here, right? So, so we sometimes say, well, maybe it's therapeutic or whatever. But, you know, we, it's always a question for many of us kind of to bring our petitions to God and ask him to answer. Often more than the opposite, that it is God who speaks, and we're there to listen to what he might say to allow us to participate in his plans and his thoughts. Well, you know, it's interesting when you, when you look at, at Abraham. When you, when you look at this story, it is always God who speaks and Abraham who answers. It is as if, if things are turned around and we, we do the opposite. We just speak and, and, and we anticipate God to answer whatever we say. I wonder sometimes if you've ever thought about this. What if God is saying, <laughs> be quiet. Let me speak for a moment. Just listen up. It, it, it is just what sometimes that we, we wonder. And, and, you know, when you look at the story of Abraham and, and so many places, we, we often see this phrase, God said to Abraham, and it comes there without any explanation of whether that was an audible voice or that was just something that Abraham heard through the deep stillness of his heart. The ways God got Abraham's attention were different, but in every time, it was God who spoke and Abraham who needed to answer. That's not always the case, as I already mentioned. I want to ask you, if, why is that? H have we forgotten? Have we forgotten that God is still in the business of speaking? He is still in the business of inviting us into his presence that we may answer his call. He desire to hear us speak. Some of you may wonder about this story and, and where it comes and the flow, and, and maybe it's helpful for me to just kind of point that out, that, that if you look at the story of Scripture, this is God's revelation of who he is, right? We, we see just, you know, 18 chapters earlier, God created, he saw all things were good, then things were bad, people rebelled and rejected God, they were kicked out of his presence, and, and things got so bad, chapter 6 now, that God floods the earth, that's the story of Noah, and it's like a hitting the reset button of sorts and, and cutting, starting over. So now you think, well, they all things are well, well, pfft. Already in chapter 11 again, now they build the Tower of Babel. It, it is like there can be no stop to people not considering who God is, but God says, I want this relationship with people. So already in chapter 12, he said, I'm going to choose Abraham. And from his, from his loins shall come a people uh, that are going to be my people. And, and so... Here you have God making a covenant, a covenant that's repeated again in chapter 15, or a little bit different way in chapter 17, and here comes chapter 18, kind of revealing who God truly is. So to hear God speak has not necessarily anything to do with mystical experiences. Abilities to kind of tune into God's channel, so to speak. This has to do with us heeding God and paying attention to what He's doing, how He's interacting with our lives. When you turn to the New Testament, you see it again and again. That word that we translate to hear is rarely, if ever, about audible. Sounds that hit our ears. When, when, when Jesus talks and he said, let him who has ears hear. He is not talking about that they could hear audible things as much as he's talking about he who has ears, may he understand, pay attention to heed what God is doing. It's about not mishearing or, or being 
deaf to God's word or God's encounter. So what we see here is that, that of course, that God reveals himself in different ways to people. And, and as we listen to this, you will see what's going on. There's something very powerful that is in here. And I may have to say also in the beginning, and, and you know that from just normal human interaction, it is hard to understand someone that you don't know. It's certainly hard to trust someone that you don't know, yes? So you got to know God. So can I encourage you to spend time in his word, spend time in quiet contemplation upon his word, that you listen to who he is so you may get to know him. And if you think that's not the case, it is the case. You meet people, you may hear their words that are being spoken, but you may misunderstand what they're saying because you don't really know where it's coming from, and you may misinterpret the words. Those of you who come from different cultures, you will realize also that people of different cultures sometimes find it hard to communicate because they don't quite know the other person. And until they do, it's hard to trust. That's why we come to know God, and that's what the call is here. So let's go to this story and just kind of take it step by step as we read it, right? Nothing in the story hints that Abraham had any idea about who was coming to visit with him, who these three were. You know, the, the language that, that seems to be somewhat lofty is simply an expression of what the common kind of attitude of the day. If someone came by your tent, you treated them with the greatest friendliness, with the greatest kind of honor, the greatest way of expressing uh, courtesy and, and, and all of that. But then, as the conversation developed, it became very clear to Abraham who he had in front of him. God revealed himself uh, with his knowledge about Abraham, about Sarah and her barrenness. God, God made visible his, his power by proclaiming that, that Sarah would give birth within a year. He, he kind of showed his authority when, when Sarah tried to lie and say, I didn't laugh, and he looked at her and said, oh, yeah, you did laugh. And Abraham had no doubt that he was faced with God himself right there in his presence. And his eyes and his ears were widely open, fully attended to what God may say. Now, the contrast to that, of course, is, is Sarah, who, who kind of shrugged her shoulders, laughed a little bit to herself, and said, yeah, whatever. You see the contrast. May I ask you this? When you listen to a sermon, when you sit down to pray, when you read God's word, does he have your attention? Or are you just shrugging your shoulders, yeah, whatever. You know, this is one of the most captivating stories of scripture that come here. God is described as walking across the meadows of Mamre, conversing with Abraham. Now, we know good and well that, that the Almighty God cannot be captured by, by one event in history. There's no way to limit him that way. And yet, the story here describes the Almighty God, that while he's holding all the galaxies in their orbit, he's allowing himself to be absorbed by his conversation with Abraham. And in verse 17, we even find himself contemplating, should I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? Are you getting this? No, God cannot just be described in big, lofty, aloof terms like the Almighty God. He is also your loving Father. He is your caring friend. He is your good guiding shepherd. And we marvel 
and we should model. Why would God bring Abraham into his circle of confidence? Just think about the incredible, almost unfathomable implication that such an act from God's side has. The Lord of, of endless galaxies, the creator of all life and everything that has existed, the almighty, the all-knowing, the unfathomable, inscrutable master of all things, the judge over demons and angels and human beings. God himself takes the time and accepts the challenge and the hassle of trying to explain his intentions to a human being. Are you shocked? <laughs> Your jaw dropping to the floor? It should be. It really should be. But God says, I know Abraham. I've chosen him. Just look at verse 19. The word chosen here means that I made a friend out of him. He had changed the relationship that they had between them. God had changed the relationship between the creator and the created, between the judge and the sinner, became between the master and the servant, and he had added a new dimension. I have chosen this man to become my friend. He is to play a role in my plans. He is to sit around the boardroom table and participate in my projects. I've chosen him to be my friend. Are we hearing this? I hope we are. See, it is in this very specific and special relationship that God allowed Abraham to have that we are to understand our own relationship to God. The focus of, of this text here is, is praying for deeper understanding. And, and listen to this when we get here. It is clear that we still, of course, are the creatures that stand before the Creator. We are sinful people standing before the judge. We are servants before the Master. But Jesus himself had changed that relationship. And he has given us the same status as the father of faith when he says in, in John chapter 15, I no longer call you servants because the servants do not know what the father does. I call you friends because I have revealed all to you that the father will do. That friend is the cradle for your prayer. This is how you need to understand how you stand when you turn to God. If you are his friend, he will share his thoughts and his plans with you. If you're his partner, he will make you part of his project. No matter whatever else you can say about prayer, genuine prayer has as its first priority to participate in God's counsel about the questions that are important to him. God calls us to listen to his plans and to become part of them. So listen. Let me say it this way. It would happen when your prayers are elevated to that kind of level that they will make a true transformation in your life. That's when the task of the prayer is no longer just to bring before God a list of petitions, things you would like. Now, the very agenda for your prayer is written up in heaven. And it has to do with the greatest of things, the things of the greatest consequence. 
Prayer moves from being just you presenting your list to a matter of you coming to know his will and understand who he is. It, it was, I think, Eleanor Roosevelt who said great people share great ideas of the greatest consequence. Average people talk about their own circumstance and their own situation. Small people talk about others. See, God is now taking Abraham into the council about the destiny of Sodom. God wants us to understand in a deeper way. The discussion is no longer about Abraham's list of where his son was at the top of the list. That was taken care of. He had brought it to God. God took care of that. Now, there was no more to add. Now it was about the great things of God. And Abraham found himself shook, shaken to the bone of what he heard that God would do. How is this possible? Does, does God not understand that not everyone in Sodom was the same? Did he not know that, that one of his own relatives, Lot, lived in the city? Abraham had met with the king. He knew several of the, the citizens there. Did God not know he could not brush like with a big sweep over everything? And it shook Abraham when he heard what God's intentions were, and it thrusted him into a deep and intense prayer. It was not enough for him just to bring some kind of shallow God, save my neighbor, save my city. If it's in your will, amen, I'm out. We find a man who is terrified, terrified, when he understands God's decision. And he throws his whole life into a conversation with God. He had to understand. And friends, that is where the school of prayer is found. The, the, the true prayer can only be learned in the place where your friendship with God demands that you get to a point of understanding what is God doing? Why am I going through these things? What is happening here? I don't understand all these things. My own life, my, my, why did I fail this exam? Why is my health not going this way? Why is my marriage not going this way? And you say, well, Lord, if it's your will. No. We push to understand what God is doing and how he is involved in every way. What can we say about not my will, but your will? Are we not taught to pray that? Absolutely we are. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Prayer is about getting to the point where we can engage ourselves in God's will as so much that we become partners with God. Our vision aligns with his vision. Absolutely, that's what that is about. But far too often we have made that an excuse for being engaged. We don't even have to know or seek or struggle to find and understand what God's will is. We'll just say, God, if it's your will, you'll make it happen. I don't have to be part. Look, Abraham's prayer is an extraordinary contrast to this. The easy, shallow, superficial prayer is, is exactly an expression of a somewhat of a pseudo-piety where it, sound, it sounds right, it looks right, there's just no real substance. That's why you sometimes can feel find people who have been Christian for 10, 20, 30, even 40 years, and, and they're without the maturity of faith, the strength of God, or even the depths of spirit. And here comes Abraham teaching us what true prayer is seeking a deeper understanding. 
It is not that he's trying to, to kind of make a deal with God. We meet in Abraham someone who is desperate to understand God's will. What is happening here? You can't act like this. Should the very person, the very God who judges the earth not do what is right? The very foundation for Abraham's understanding of life was at risk here. If there was one thing he has built his life on, it was the trustworthiness of God. I don't understand, God, and I will struggle and I will continue to ask you that I may see who you are and that you're not like a stranger. The real question for Abraham was not the destiny of Sodom. The sin of his prayer was the very being of God. I hope you're seeing this, friends. It was to understand his action. It's one thing to pray for the doomed and the damned. It's quite another thing to question the very integrity of God. But he had to. He had to. He had been invited in as a friend of God. And he saw this craziness of his own words, and say, how dare I speak? Look at verse 27. I'm nothing but dust and ashes. He fell ill even by speaking that way to the Almighty. But he had to. He had to. As one who had been invited in, he had to. And it was this vehement persistence that he refused to kind of skate over things that he didn't just get, that made his prayers real, that avoided that they became just kind of superficial expressions. It was a prayer that at one at the same time feared the power of God and, and that yet feared to let go of God until God had revealed his heart. Are we getting this? Oh, may God work in our lives that we see these things. I'll, I'll round this up by simply see here, right? This is a prayer that somewhat reflects what I say. I said, woe unto me because my eyes have seen the king. Abraham refused to let go, and we follow the prayer. We follow the prayer. God, I need to see your faithfulness. And in every step of the prayer, the Bible describes what is happening. Why, why Abraham stopped with 10, I don't know. We will never know. What we do know, that Abraham understood. He had been assured of God's faithfulness and his trustworthiness. Every single answer from God came back to him. I will spare the city for 50. I will spare it for 45. I will spare it for 40, for 30, for 20, for 10. If there's just 10, I will spare the city. And Abraham got the point. He saw God in a new light. Abraham had become a greater human being with a greater God. The prayer had changed him. God's purpose of inviting him in to the heavenly courtroom had been accomplished. The meeting was adjourned, and Abraham stood back, alone, transformed by his experience and his discovery. God had made himself known to him in the midst of his unfathomable greatness. Friends, we sometimes relegate prayer to just a spiritual exercise. What we learn from Abraham here is that he became a greater human being. He became useful. 
he, he needed to understand, who are you, God? That I may say yes from the depths of my being when you say yes, and no from the depths of my being when you say no. Your life, friends, will change if you understand prayer needs to come from this deeper understanding. Seek it. Don't skate over it. Can we stand?